me at the Beijing Motor Show and here I am at the Aura stand and that's a brand that's familiar to Singapore but there's a whole lot more to see and I don't know if you can see this but there are a lot of people here. The organizers have said there's more than a hundred global premieres, there's 41 concept cars and 163 press conferences including the one going on behind me right now. So it's just going to be impossible to see everything there is to see today but I'm just going to go check out some of the more interesting cars and maybe share my thoughts with you along the way. If you're ready, let's go! Okay, I want to start with something that I think is actually a poster child for what the Chinese car industry is like and that's the brand behind me which is Avatar. So Avatar's launch for Beijing is the car behind me, that's the Avatar 1-2. Uh, it's a full electric car of course and it's a kind of a fastback uh, five-seater. And just a quick primer, Avatar is a joint venture between CATL, the battery giant, and Chang'an. And actually Huawei is the software platform supplier for this car. But I actually want to have a look at the 1-1 One -One instead. That's getting a lot of buzz on stage right now. And that's a facelifted car or a facelifted version of a car that Avatar has been selling for a while. And quick look at it behind me before I turn the camera around. So in terms of the hardware, the wheelbase for this car is like 2.95 meters. So you know it's going to be really spacious inside. But what's really interesting is that there's 11 high-def cameras uh, which kind of replace mirrors on this car and rear screen. I mean, they still have these features on the car, but I think they've become more or less optional. And of course, it's a really fast car. The twin motor version gets to 100 in just 3.9 seconds. So what I think is super interesting about Avatar is that apparently its customers have altogether logged something like 50 million kilometers on autopilot. That's like a quarter of the total driving distance that they've done. This car is already on the road doing that. Can you imagine? And the self-driving part is where Huawei's software comes in. So this is why I say this is a poster boy for the Chinese car industry. You've got a car company, Chang'an, you've got a Chinese battery giant, CATL, and then you've got Huawei all coming together to do a car and that's the result. And if you think about it, that's amazing because this car brand is actually only six years old. So of course, one of the things I'm on the lookout for is Chinese cars that will be coming to Singapore and I found one. This is Xpeng and the first model that's coming to Singapore is the Xpeng G6 which is basically China's answer to the Tesla Model Y. Xpeng is an interesting one. I mean, they've just signed an agreement with Volkswagen to share platform so they're going to do two cars together and I really wonder what that's going to be like. They also have a flying car and that should be interesting because the founder, He Xiaopeng, isn't actually all 100% focused on making cars. What he wants to do is sell mobility solutions. So I wonder if a flying car is actually going to be coming to Singapore too. Man, there's a lot of people here and the risk of human collision is really, really high. This is actually the first Beijing show since the pandemic. So since 2019, I think that was the last one. So naturally, the interest in cars is actually sky high right now. I think half the country is here to check out what the show has to offer. So let's have a look at something from one of the more familiar brands and that's Mini. So we've got behind me the Mini Ace Man which is having its global launch here in Beijing. It's an all-electric family car I would say and it kind of completes Mini's new lineup. It slots between the Countryman, the new Countryman and of course the Cooper. So it's kind of in between in terms of size and it does offer five seats. What I found out is that it's not only pure electric but will only ever be pure electric. So there's never going to be a combustion version and that's because this car was built from the ground up on an all-electric platform. So it ought to be quite spacious in the back. But I have seen the boot and it's only 300 litres and I have my doubts about how useful that is going to be. It is also interesting that they chose to launch it here in China. But you know what? The Chinese buy more electric cars than the rest of the planet put together. But the Ace Man is coming to Singapore next year. So I guess that means, well, Singapore is still kind of important, right? So I've wandered along to the Mercedes-Benz stand and it's actually quite a big one but after a bit of searching I actually finally found the G-Spot. The car I'm here to see is right behind me. That's the electric G-Wagon. It's got a strange name. It's G580 with EQ technology. So it's bathed in blue right now because it is electric. What I can tell you is it has four motors, one for each wheel. Each one apparently has something like 150 horsepower so I think this car has 600 horsepower and it zooms to 100 
in less than five seconds. Each wheel has its own gearbox as well, so two speeds. So it's, it's a car with four electric motors and four gearboxes. Mercedes-Benz says it is the ultimate in off-roading and it can do things like actually spin around on the spot like a tank. What's really significant about this car is not so much the fact that it's been launched at all, but maybe the fact that it's been launched here. It just goes to show just how important China is as a market right now. So when I say this is a big show, what I mean is there is actually a lot to see. So there are all these interesting new cars and a lot of brands that I never heard of. But when I say it's a big show, what I mean is that the floor area is pretty huge. Like, if you want to see everything there is to see at the Beijing Motor Show, that's a little bit like uh, going to every shop inside Vivo City twice. So here's an interesting car from a new brand. It's iCar, which is owned by Cherry. And behind me is a 03T, which I think is a concept car. There's already a 03 on the road. So I don't know what the T stands for because it's not turbocharged. Uh, this is a full electric car. But maybe the T stands for terrain or something because as you can see, it's actually more outdoorsy looking. There's wider bumpers, there's flat arches, and the car actually has more ground clearance than a normal 03. There's a rear motor with 135 kilowatts, and then there's a front motor that adds 70 kilowatts, and the range is apparently 500 kilometers, 0 to 100 in 6.5 seconds. So the performance is sensible rather than scintillating. But you know what, this car looks like it was a lot of fun to do, and it kind of reminds me of that period in time in the late 80s, maybe early 90s, when the Japanese car companies were flush with cash and they let the designers and engineers just do whatever they wanted. And we had a lot of cool, fun cars come out of Japan during that era. So of course you can't come to a Chinese motor show and not stop in on BYD. That's now the leading Chinese car maker, not just for electric cars, but all kinds of cars. So let's just pop inside and see what they have to offer. So what I have behind me is the BYD Ocean M concept car. It's only a concept car right now, but apparently it hints at a production model that BYD is going to start selling in the third quarter of this year. As you can see, it's a hatchback and it's bigger than the Dolphin and smaller than the 803, which is kind of a crossover, right? So think about, say, a Volkswagen Golf in terms of size, or let's call it the Volkswagen ID, since it is all electric. What I heard is that it is rear-wheel drive. So that ought to be quite fun. And you can see a lot of carbon fiber bits around the car. There's a really nice carbon fiber rear wing, and it comes with its own feather duster as well. I don't know if all the carbon fiber bits are gonna make it onto the production cover. That would be cool, wouldn't it? I don't know the range of the performance figures, but I'm betting it's gonna be a little bit more pricey than the 803, but below the seal. So let's call it, say, around about $200,000 in our money, if and when it comes to Singapore. Okay, I, I'm not sure what's going on behind me, but this is China, so of course, there's gonna be a couple of pandas even at a motor show. Okay, well, something else I want to show you is that diagonally opposite BYD is a brand called Fang Cheng Pao. I'm not sure if you heard of it, but it's actually a BYD brand, and it is the brand's upmarket label. Why do I say that? Have a look at this car behind me. That's the Super 9. Really interesting speedster. Wolfgang Egger is the head of design for BYD. I think he's like the design director. He used to design Lamborghini, so you can clearly see the Italian influence in this car buttresses, it's an open speedster so there's no roof but I wonder if they'll produce it and if they'll produce it with a roof. And as far as I know there's no performance figures for this car yet but you know what the Yang Wang U9 that's another BYD brand and that has 1300 horsepower from four electric motors. Fang Chen Bao is a bit of a strange brand. I don't really know what to make of it. You can see the other car they brought to Beijing behind me. That's the Bao 8. And that is a three-row luxury SUV, six seats or seven seats. And I believe it has a plug-in hybrid setup with more than 500 kilowatts. So that would be more than 700 horsepower. So very, very powerful, but it's going to be expensive. I think here in China, it sells for something like 80,000 US dollars. So I'm not so sure what the volumes are going to be like on that one, but this is a car that BYD is actually selling direct to consumers. No dealers involved. I think you go online and order one. So it'll be an interesting test case to see how that one works out. 
So seeing brands like Function Fao really made me wonder if the Chinese are having this idea that they should just try out different things and see what sticks. I mean, BYD doesn't only have Function Fao as a luxury label, it's got Yang Wang, and it also has Denza. And that reminds me of another car that I really, really, really want to see here. Okay, so here I am at Denza, and the star of the show here is this car behind me, the Z9 GT, or Z9 GT, if you want to be American about it. And I'm starting at the back because this is a shooting rig, and it's a big, big car. It's more than 5.2 meters long, apparently. And it's a heavy, heavy car. It weighs more than 2.9 tons. But there's a lot, a lot of power to counter that. It's got three motors, two in the back for torque vectoring, and apparently they total 952 horsepower. So this car is going to be super duper fast. So I guess the question now is, do you want to buy one of these or do you want to buy a Porsche Panamera? And the reason I ask that is because this car was actually first spotted testing in German roads, which does say a lot. And I have to say, it is a mark of confidence taking on a brand like Porsche. Just a quick primer now on who owns Denza. It used to be a 50-50 joint venture between BYD and Mercedes-Benz, but Mercedes has apparently been diluted down to 10% now. Anyway, I have to say, it's a really, really gutsy move on BYD's part to go to Germany and take on the likes of Porsche head to head. Let's see how that one goes. Check out what's going on behind me, guys. Uh, that lady looks like she's uh, broadcasting live from the show, but she's not an influencer. I think she's actually a sales lady from one of the dealerships that deals with this brand here, which is Dongfeng Motor. It's very common to see in China, actually, uh, people from dealerships coming down to broadcast live from the show. So they'll tell you all about the cars as they're unveiled. And of course, you build a relationship with them. And if you're interested in the car, you know who to look for. Very, very interesting business model. And I think it just goes to show how hungry some of the salespeople in China's car industry are. Okay, here I am at another familiar name, but this time with a very Chinese take to what it's showing here at Beijing. So behind me is the Volkswagen ID Code, and that's a concept car. So as you can see, the styling really departs from the other ID cars, and uh, there's like a lit Volkswagen badge up front as well as behind. And you can see the headlights are actually putting on a little light show for us. And apparently the light show is updated every three months. But you know what? Uh, this is actually only a concept car and it is a very sort of fast four-seater. And you can see that it's very Chinese in execution, so it's very smooth in terms of its lines. And then you have very modern features like no wing mirrors and cameras instead. If you like what you see behind me, well, too bad because apparently this car is actually only going to be for China and it's going to form the basis for a flagship car for the Chinese market. And you can see why it's designed to Chinese taste and it looks so different from the other ID cars and it kind of brings up an interesting point that car makers, in order to succeed in China, are really going to have to do things that please the Chinese. Okay, let's have a look at another brand that's coming to Singapore now and that's Zika and here I am and holy cow, what the heck is going on here because look at the number of people lining up to get into Zika. Okay, now Zika is going to be launched in Singapore pretty soon and one of the first cars coming into our market is this one, the 009. It's a luxury MPV, I think maybe Toyota Alpha, but electric. And if you ask me, this car is really going to test the market's appetite for Chinese luxury labels because by my estimates, I think it's going to cost close to half a million dollars in Singapore. But there is going to be a volume seller that's more affordable and that's the Zika X. So here's the Zika X behind me and that's kind of a compact SUV. And you know, Zika is a luxury label, but I think you can add high performance to that because this car, the twin motor version, gets from zero to 100 in 3.8 seconds. It has enough battery capacity for 445 kilometers of range and apparently you can charge it from 10 to 80% in half an hour with 150 kilowatts. The interesting thing to me is that this car is mechanically the same as the Volvo EX30 and that's because they both have the same parent company which is Geely. So here's an interesting question for Singaporeans, right? The cars are mechanically the same, so which ones will Singapore prefer? An old brand like Volvo or something bold and new like Zika? So another car that Zika brought to the Beijing show is the Mix. Uh, that's a concept car and it's a kind of smaller MPV than the 009. I think it's maybe meant to tempt you for something like a Volkswagen ID bus, although it does look a little bit 
smaller than that. I think it's uh, kind of intriguing that the Chinese seem to really embrace the idea of electric luxury MPVs, but it's a segment that the Europeans actually have left alone. Um, I mean, you can't imagine a BMW MPV or a Mercedes MPV, right? So maybe for historical reasons or maybe for brand baggage or stuff like that, that's just a segment where you don't find any European players. Okay, let's go and look at a car by a brand that is kind of new, but maybe familiar, and that's smart. That was just launched in Singapore, and they've actually brought a concept car to Beijing. I can't wait to see what that's all about. Okay, the star of the stand here is the Smart Hashtag 5. It's only a concept car, but as you can see, it's the biggest Smart ever and they will actually be producing it. When it comes out, I think it's going to be a rival to something like the Volkswagen T1 or maybe the BMW X1. You may know that Smart is a 50-50 joint venture between Geely and Mercedes-Benz, but the twist is, it's the Chinese who did the engineering and not the Germans. The Germans actually did the styling. And as you can see, they've done a very rugged job with this one. It's, look at those chunky tires and uh, you've got all these elements like uh, those camping lights and plastic cladding for the wheel archers and a big bash plate, all looking very ready to go on a camping trip, even with the lights on top to shine away. And the reason they've made it look like that, I think, yeah. is that it seems to be a growing trend in China for the outdoors life. And I've been seeing a lot of cars that look very, very rugged. They seem to be the, sort of the Chinese answer to cars like the Toyota Land Cruiser or maybe the Land Rover Defender. So this kind of seems to ride that trend, but I think they've really done a good job. If you're actually wondering about the specs for the Smart Hashtag 5, I don't think Smart actually has released them yet, but I have heard that it's got quite a big battery, more than 100 kilowatts, so that should allow it to comfortably exceed 500 kilometers on a single charge. I'm sure that as before, there'll be a single motor version as well as a dual motor version, so it's either going to be fast or very, very fast. And here we're looking at the new McLaren. Just kidding, it's actually the Xiaomi SU7. And as you can see behind me, Xiaomi is getting a lot of buzz here. There's so many people who want to go in and see the SU7 that you actually have to take a queue number and wait your turn. So I don't really have time for that. So I'm just going to skip the SU7, but apparently it's doing very, very well. Xiaomi has announced that they sold something like more than 75,000 units within the first 28 days of its launch. Let's see if they can keep it up, but it just goes to show that I think the Chinese have kind of proven that they can do cars. What they need to do now is do branding, and with a brand name like Xiaomi, which is so famous that, well, everyone has something Xiaomi in their house nowadays, maybe that's the recipe for success. So here's a question for you, internet. Which car in China actually has the biggest fan base? Well, it's this one, the one behind me. When you can see it, it's the Havao H9, which apparently has the single largest car club here in China. This is an all-new one with all-new styling. And it has very chunky looks. As you can see, it has one of those retractable floorboards. And if you look at the taillights, they kind of remind me of a certain car that likes to defend things from a certain English off-roading brand. It does come with a variety of powertrains, apparently. I think there's a diesel version as well as a petrol hybrid, as well as a plug-in hybrid electric version. And the H9 is actually right next to the H6, if I can find it which is actually a much more mainstream SUV. This one's a facelifted version, and apparently Harbaugh has given it 128 revisions. It's a five-seat SUV, and I've actually sat inside. The quality is okay, and uh, that's a hybrid version, which should be pretty efficient. Since it is a Chinese car, it should be pretty cost competitive. And guess what? Harbaugh might actually be headed to Singapore. They're already in talks with a dealer. So the question is, would you rather be seen in a rugged H9 or a more mainstream H6? But I suppose the wider question is, would Singaporeans give a brand like Harvard a chance? Well, so far the rest of the world seems to have, because the H6 is apparently consistently one of the top 10 best-selling SUVs in the world. Okay guys, I'm pretty much out of gas and losing daylight here, and I think that um, I haven't even scratched the surface of what the Beijing Motor Show has to offer, but a couple of themes have jumped out at me. The first one is that I think we're going to see the car industry splinter a little bit, at least with some car makers who are going to need to do a line of cars just for the Chinese market and then different cars for the rest of the world. You kind of saw that with the Volkswagen ID code. The next thing that jumps out is collaboration, because if you can't beat them, join them, right? 
And I think that Western car makers are increasingly teaming up with Chinese car makers, not just for market access, but to borrow technology. So we see that Volkswagen is buying into Xpeng. Uh, we also see that Smart, for example, is a German-Chinese partnership. And again, it's not the Germans who supply the engineering. The third theme is that, well, China is still super important. So you've got major car launches here. And I think the reason is that this country just buys more cars than any other country. And that's why Mini launched the Aceman here. It's also why there's an electric G-Wagon here. And finally, the fourth theme that jumps out, I think is that the Chinese have really started to flip the script on their relationship with the rest of the car industry. It used to be that every car company wanted to set up in China and just sell into this enormous market. But now it seems to be the other way around. The Chinese car makers have come up with very good cars and they seem like they're ready to export to the rest of the world. So it used to be that everyone wanted to conquer China, but I think now China wants to conquer the rest of the world. It's one of the more popular cars here, so there is a line to see the car, so I'm just going to stand here because I'm lazy. So that's my really quick look at the Beijing Motor Show, and I uh, hope you enjoyed that. As for me, I think I need a shower. I think I need a foot massage as well. But I hope you enjoyed that and please consider hitting subscribe. For now, that's it from me. Thanks for watching. See you again.